build my life upon your love, Jesus. It is a firm foundation that I will put my trust in you, O Lord, and I will know that it will not be shaken in every storm in life to know that your feet stand upon the solid rock. Why don't we, we're going to have a little bit of discussion, so at this point I encourage you to maybe move your chairs in a way, and then I'll introduce the questions after, but if you go to your groups now, the groups you just played those exciting send it back games to, so go ahead, um, if there are new people in your group, make sure you have room to include them, if your group is really large, you may want to adjust it, but if you get comfortable, and I'll talk about the questions in a moment. All right. Again, welcome to our Easter conference. My name is Enoch. I was about to say I'm one of the pastors of this church, but that's, that's not here. That's my normal line at my church. Uh, I want to welcome you. If those of you who are recently just joining us this morning, uh, nice to meet you. Hope to meet you soon. Uh, these are going to be our discussion groups. I see the groups are larger in some of the cases, so you may have to adjust. I leave it to your leaders to figure out if you can give everyone about, you know, 10 seconds of share, or if you want to subdivide, you guys can figure that out. But there's two questions, easy to warm up, and I anticipated some people might be new, so there's some easier questions to access. In case you are just joining us this morning, we're going to have a little bit of discussion here, then I'm going to ask you to reorient your chairs back to the front, we'll have a quick uh, talk, and then we'll go back to discussion in these groups again, and then we'll go on a break, and then we'll come back for a proper sermon. I just love using the word proper in Ireland and the UK, because we never say that word like that. So a proper sermon where then after that you'll have more time for discussion. So to ease into it, um, if you get the first two questions, this has to do with the message this morning. So it's not just, I, it's not because I could not think of a better question. That might be true partly, but now, first of all, I would like everyone in your group to go around and think right now. Some of you are internal thinkers and processors. What are your favorite and least favorite fruits and why? You have to give at least one reason. And because I like it does not count, okay? You could say, because my mother made me eat it. That's why I hate it. Or because my mother made me eat it. That's why I love it. So whatever you want. And then secondly, again, related to this, and I know some people here, we have different ages, but everyone here can look back to when you were really small. Do you have a childhood toy or object that you were attached to when you were smaller or reluctant to give up or still have, okay? Share about that and what happened to that object. For this one, I'm going to give you a quota. 
I'm going to say at least three people in your group have to share. Some of your groups have like nine people. At least you can get three people to share, okay? I, I'm going to also give you a quota. The oldest person has to share. And the youngest person has to share. And then the, old, shh, and the oldest and youngest person get to pick between the two of them the middle person to share. However, if the oldest person is unclear on to be the older, the older person gets to tell someone younger than them to share, okay? Because that way you'll, because maybe you're, you're, maybe you're not comfortable letting people know that you're like 24. You're so ashamed I'm 24. So um, how about this? Maybe not the oldest, the most mature, wisest person, okay? That works too, okay? So now we're volunteering, okay? So, so go ahead. You have about nine minutes. So that means about 15 seconds per person for the first question and about 18.3 seconds for the next question. All right, so go ahead and do that. Go around, say your name if you haven't met each other yet, and just get to know each other, okay? Please go ahead.
hopefully you're moving to number two if you haven't done that yet. The, root, the fruit is boiling, so move on. All right, we're going to bring it back in about one minute. Now's the time you appoint someone in your group to share. I'd like to hear one of these objects of your childhood. We're going to do that very quickly. So pick someone. It cannot be the people that had to share already. They won't laugh at you, Steffi. It's fine. Just don't tell them it's you, Steffi. Oh, sorry. All right, let's bring it together. Shh. I, I, again, I apologize to interrupt you. We'll do I'm just, I am just so interested to know what Irish folk have as their cherished childhood toy, toys. I would go around and do the fruit, but that might, that might get old and spoil. But can we talk about just some object from their childhood? I just, anyone want to rate? There's so many groups in here, but just anyone have an interesting thing? We got some pointing. We don't volunteer people. We encourage them to share. If they're, if they're comfortable sharing. Are you comfortable sharing? Is that Eva back there? Is that Eva? Do you want to share, Eva? No pressure, just a hundred of us looking at you. <laughs> Favorite toy, yeah, nice and loud. Dude, better fix that, Kevin. Try to make up for it. The siblings were the, wow. That's good. All right. So, okay, wow, that's, that's very, very close family. Oscar's like, wait, what? <laughs> that's why you play? Okay, all right, thank you. It doesn't have to be as sweet as that thing, but any other uh, childhood objects or any toys or people, I guess that counts too. You, know, you don't have a pet, but you got a little brother. That's cool. But Come on, there must be some interesting things in a room this size. Blankets and pillows. Okay. Just, just random blankets and pillows or any particular <laughs> specific blanket? Is there something printed on it? Oh, baby blankets and pillows. Okay, that's fine. I think we can relate to that. Good, good. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? There's got to be something more. Toy cars? Nice, good, good. Actually, you don't give those up. You just get real ones, but yeah. So <laughs> that's the secret, fine, good. Anything else? Okay. Is there some distinct Irish cherished toy object that only is found here, like grass or something? <laughs> I picked this blade of grass and I keep it with it. Was it over there? No, okay. You're pointing at someone? Yeah. Barney, cherished, reluctant, that's great. Was it? Life-size Barney or a little Barney? 
Little Barney. Stuff Barney or like hard toy? Like Stuff Barney, squeezable? Did he go, ooh, like that? Okay. All right, yeah, good, good, good. Okay, great, cool. You still have Barney? Oh, you should have given it to her. <laughs> oh, you gave him a new home. Great. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, this does relate to the message, which I'll jo- uh, share briefly. But at this point, so that you have a, your neck is not turning all things weird during the message, this is the time I invite you to turn your seats back and be able to face comfortably front. And then I'll read the passage, and then we'll open in prayer. Thank you for your sharing. And thank you for your rapid reorienting of the chairs. I know it's a lot of movements. Appreciate that. You can go there, that's cool. Well, if you have a Bible, would you take it and open and meet me in the New Testament book of John? John chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible with you or on your device, perhaps you could make a friend, look over their shoulder at their book or at their device. John chapter 15. We talked about fruit, and we talked about sort of things that we give up as we grow, because we're looking at this new theme of, uh, we've been talking about come thirsty, the idea of getting into God's word, and now we're talking about getting God's word into us. If we're to be coming thirsty for the Lord and for his teaching, we do want to go to his word, but I want to talk today about how do you know or what to do to get God's word in us. Not that we just go to his word, but his word has to go into us. And what I mean by that, especially if you that sounds strange, is we want to not just read it, we want it to internalize into our very souls. John chapter 15, I would like to read for us verses 1 through 11, and then I'm going to open in prayer. John 15, 1 through 11. Would you follow along as I read? Hear now the word of our Lord. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I am him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to me my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Shall we pray together? Our Father, as we come to you this morning, we ask that you would encourage us through your word, that if we are thirsty to to seek your truth and your teaching, the words of Christ, that you would help us uh, drink full of all that he has. If we find honestly that we are not interested, we're not thirsty for hearing this, then would you awaken that thirst? Lord, we want to be honest and confess, I, maybe I'm not really interested in what Jesus has to say. Lord, meet us where we are, and by your grace, meet us there, and then move us forward into a deeper understanding and relationship and love for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. So we've been talking a lot about um, sort of God's word, understanding it, approaching it, and this morning we're really going into the idea of getting into God's word and getting God's word into us. And part of that has to do with change, making change, changing things. Now, when I think about change, uh, my wife and I, we bought our first home, our only home, about 11 or 12 years ago. And we'd never been homeowners before. I'd never been particularly handy fixing things. But economics um, and just the desire to fix things and get my hands on things, there were things I would fix. So if the faucet outside or the, the hose spigot needed something, I'd fix that. Our snowblower, if we needed to work it, I would try to fix it here and there. Oh, we have snow in Boston, and it's on the ground, and it gets this high, and we have to have machines that blow the snow. They're called children. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, no, machines, and it's, uh, it uses petrol. 
petrol, you have more gas, and you drive it, and so things like that. So I'd fix that. I would, I would try to tweak my motorcycle. I would look under the hood of my car. There are certain things I would do. And in my home, I would actually try to tweak computers. I'd open apart computers, even the things I say you're not supposed to open. I'd void the warranty and try to, you know, because with the internet, because you can trust everything on the internet, I would fix things. But there's a couple of things I decided I would not try fixing. Anything electrical in the house, I just won't touch. Anything electricity related. Uh, my wife will, <laughs> so, but this is good because, you know. But um, the other thing I won't touch is I remember when we needed a new toilet. Um, you have toilets here, I've seen them. So <laughs> it's so funny because at church, our senior pastor, he has an apartment that he rents out, and a bunch of people, they've changed toilets. So they're just like, yeah, toilet, real easy to change. You know, just get the donut. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, if you don't know, then you've never done it. So you get a donut. It's not a real donut. It's like the little thing that keeps the stuff in the thing. And then you do this stuff. But I just thought about it. I was reading about it online. I was watching videos. I think I got the idea. But I decided I would rather see my house burn down than mess up installing a toilet. That would be unpleasant. And I told my wife, can we just pay someone to come do it? She's like, yeah, that's fine. So there are things I won't touch because I'm scared of making those changes. I don't think I'm qualified to make those changes. Well, part of coming thirsty and growing in the Lord is you come to a point and say, how does God actually take the Bible? And how does God actually take the teachings of Christ and use that to change someone, to bring transformation in someone's life? A lot of Christians have actually never really thought about it. How does actually reading the Bible lead to life change? How do I know and see that God's word is in me, his teaching is transforming me from the inside out? And so this morning, I want four points to show you four points from this text that will go through this well-known story. If you're about my age, uh, you sang a song about vine and branches probably in the 80s, um, 70s, 80s, 90s. And so there's four points I'd like to show you from the text. I'll li list them off for you if it helps to follow along or if you're taking notes, and then we'll take them each one by one. First of all, we're going to see what is God's primary means of change? What is the method in this text that God uses when he describes when he changes you, when he changes me, when he wants to change you for better, when he wants to see something positive happen in your life? What is the metaphor? What is his means? How does he describe that change? Secondly, after we look at the means, we're going to consider what is God's goal when he wants to change us? When we talk about show me, you know, help your love flow from me out to others, we're talking about God to change. But what is his goal when he wants to transform people's lives? What is he trying to accomplish in your life or in my life? So first, what is the means of change? Secondly, what is the goal for change? Thirdly, how do we participate in that change? Like, how do we sort of respond to God's invitation to have our lives transformed? How do we, what do we actually do in the midst of facilitating and partnering and inviting God to change us. The means of change, the goal of change, how do we participate in this change, and fourth and lastly, what's the basis of this change? Why should we believe that you or I will be any different from having to gone through this? What is the basis that we can say from the Bible, from life, that God indeed does change people, that the word of God does get into us and through us change us and make the world better? Okay, so that's good. You guys sleepy yet? <laughs> if you're not saying no, then you're probably sleepy. So hang in there. I, again, I told you yesterday, feel free to sleep. It's fine. That's fine. Just don't snore. So first of all, God's means of change. Now this, again, I'm not a very organized, natural, countryside person, but when you look at this thing, the main, the main imagery is God. There's this picture of a vine dresser, like the gardener. There's the picture of the vine and then the branches. And then this main image of God growing you. He's like, oh, we're like a plant. It grows up like a tree. That's great. But you know the main image here is not about how does God grow the plant? Does he water it? Does he speak carbon monoxide, dioxide, and oxygen back? Does he do that? No. God takes something sharp, and he cuts it. He prunes it. Now, that's kind of interesting. A lot of us enjoy gardening and plants and farming, perhaps, because, you know, I apparently live on a farm uh, here with Tommy and Christina. But the whole idea sounds great, but I just want you to really think about this. This is not sound 
very pleasant from the perspective of the plant. Take a look. Chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus is saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He's going to prune it. He's going to prune it. He's going to trim it. He's going to cut it. When I was a small boy, my mother liked to grow roses in her garden. So I'd go outside, and she would, you know, I'd, she'd make me collect the you know, the things she'd cut and stuff. So I'd have to stand there, and she'd take shears, these gardening shears, and she'd take the, the, the plant, the rose bush, and there's a weak or dying part of the bush. She'd just cut it off, snip it off. That's what it, we got that. So the idea is cutting it. We have a blueberry bush that someone, Karen's sister, gave us. It, blueberries, um, they're berries that are blue in the States. Okay? So blueberries, you good, you have them here. So blueberries, or you can import them or... Amazon, Wikipedia, blueberries. And so the first year we got it, we're excited. And they said, you're not going to get any fruit for the first year, season, or two. So we thought, OK. But after a while, the blueberries, when they finally actually popped up in the bush, they just did not seem very good. So Karen you know, did what every godly Christian woman would do, looked up a YouTube video, and then figured out, what is wrong with this plant? There's no dying branches. But it turns out she has to prune this bush. And the part about pruning dead plants, dead parts of the tree, I get. You know what I didn't understand? Is when you look at the tree and the bush, and there's a dead piece, you cut it off. I get that. But you know what I didn't understand is you actually have to take a perfectly healthy part of the bush and also cut off perfectly healthy parts. Now, why would you do that? Apparently, because a blueberry bush of that type in our climate can only have seven main branches. They're called canes. So they get about six or seven canes. If you have too many of those main branches or canes coming off the center of the bush, you will not get the ripest, juiciest, sweetest blueberry. So pruning is not just cutting off dead parts, sick parts, unwanted parts. Pruning, which every one of Jesus' hearers would have understood in that culture, pruning means taking perfectly healthy, good, normal parts that are limiting you and cutting them off. Now, this sounds, just imagine, we think it's good because we told our boys, why aren't the blueberries getting sweeter? Well, because mama's going to go prune it. It's like, oh, awesome. Then we'll get good blueberries. When? Next week? Next year. But anyway, the whole idea is you, Karen takes the shears and walks out to the yard, and it only takes 10, 15 minutes. But you know what I imagine in my kind of immature mind? I said, what if the bush could talk? OK, bush. It's time to do some work on you so that you can bear more fruit. Oh, great. OK, so there's a branch there that's sick. It's dying. Yeah, I don't feel good. Can you help me? Yeah, I'm going to just get that sick thing right off. Oh, thank you, Karen. Snip. Oh, you know, it stings a little, but that feels good. That's, you know, I'm feeling better already. I'm feeling I'm going to be able to make great blueberries. And snip, snip. OK, good. We're done. No, Bush. In order to get the best blueberries from you, we're going to have to Divert your resources into as few of these canes as possible. So you get the juiciest blueberries. Uh, what does that involve? Well, see that branch there? Yeah, I like that branch. That branch has been with me since three years ago. It's got to go. No! And the shears are coming. It's like, it's like when our kids needed earwax picked out. Cantonese people apparently have this bamboo thing. OK, some of you are like, oh my gosh, don't mention it. And so whenever Karen would bring that bamboo thing out, my children would go, no, the picture of doom and stuff. But the bush would come, and they'd be like, snip, and like, no. And if the bush could talk to my wife, you cruel person, why would you snip off perfectly healthy parts of me? And we'll get to that in a moment. But here's the basic notion. When God wants to prune you, we get it when he wants to take off something sick unhealthy. Sometimes there's relationships that are not healthy for either party. Sometimes there's patterns of our lives. Sometimes there's, well, sin by definition is unhealthy, is not good for your soul. We may not like it, we may not want it, but we deep down know that's good. But you know what? In order for God to really work in your life, there may be something perfectly fine and normal. But in order to accomplish what God wants for you, he's going to prune that 
You think God growing is about giving me things and helping give me more gifts, more resources, clarity in my calling, direction. You know what God's metaphor is to help all of us be more meaningful for him? God, especially in this modern day, it's not about giving you more things to think about and do and learn. Those are fine. God really, in order to make you more, to get the word into you, he wants to remove things. In our church ministry, one of the basic rules, and especially on our English side, if you want to start a new ministry, you do not get to start a new ministry until you tell me which ministry you're going to stop. Or at least decrease energy. Why? Because assuming you're working hard... You don't just make more bricks with the same amount of straw to use the ancient Egyptian slavery of you know, the Israelites. Make more bricks, but now you get your own straw. Make more bricks, now I'm not going to give you any straw. It's the Old Testament picture. And so in our church ministry and in any business that wants to survive, if you start doing this new thing, you've got to cut back. Your kid wants to do this new activity or sport, well, what are you going to cut back? You want to pick up this new hobby? What are you going to cut back? You want to start this new relationship, this new venture, this new, uh, you know, go to this new exercise routine? Fine. What are you going to cut back to make room, to make energy? Same with God. In order for you to be all that God wants for you, he might take a look at, see those three things there? Yep, they're all perfectly fine. They're not bad, but one of them may have to go because I have something more for you. We say this also in our context. The enemy of the best, whatever the best is, the enemy of the best is not the bad. The enemy of the best is the good. Those 50, 60 good things that we all do that keep us from focusing our energy on the one or two things to be the best. What is God's means of making change? And we're going to see how this relates to the Bible. But God's means is to take your life and prune out things that are unhealthy, sick, holding you down, and you might be someone that has to be pruned. You might be the pruned off something or someone. That we get. Difficult, but we understand. But in order for God to really prune you, he may take something, he may call you and say, that thing that is perfectly fine, it's actually limiting what I want to do in you and through you. That's what this says. And we're going to get to how this relates to God's word in our, ne- in our next few points. But here's this thing. God wants to prune that. Now you think this. Well, wait. There's this perfectly fine thing in my life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an activity I enjoy. Maybe it's whatever it is. And God's going to take it away? Why? Why would God do that? Karen walks up to the blueberry bush with shears. Why? Why no? Ah! You know, bush abuse and stuff. So why would you do that? Why would God cut off perfectly healthy branches? Why would God trim parts of the vine that are perfectly healthy? And the answer, we already know, to bear more fruit. That's why. When God prunes, it's not because he is sadistic. It's not because he imagines the bush crying out, snip, ha, 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 snip, ha. He's, he's not looking at your life and pruning you and like, yes, suffer. No, he is saying, I'm pruning this. This is unhealthy, you will not bear fruit. This is healthy, but you have too many branches. I'm going to cut this back so what remains will bear the biggest, tastiest, most beautiful fruit. See this here. Take a look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. That is why God will do things. He wants to bear more fruit in your life, more fruit in my life. He wants to bear more fruit. Now, scholars talk about what does this fruit mean. Sometimes the theologians or Bible scholars talk about the fruit. Maybe it's like the character and the development of Christ like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Or, some people think in the Gospel of John, fruit typically means the fruit of conversion, meaning that your life would bear fruit in the form of helping others discover and see who Christ is and sharing your faith and the hope of the Gospel. I think Jesus specifically doesn't get into it, because I don't think it really matters his principle for this exact passage. His point is this. You want to be more fruitful in your life? You want to have a bigger impact? Then I'm going to prune you. Think about this. Whenever we come and we pray, God, I want to grow today, guess what you're asking for? God, prune me. 
When we say, God, I want you to change our church. We want to reach more people with the love of Jesus. God's going to prune the church. You're asking for God to cut off the... Un- you cannot say, God, help me, fill me, bless me, make me have great impact, make my life significantly impactful in this world. If you say those nice-sounding things, you're actually saying, God, I invite you to cut off the parts that are unhealthy for me, and God, cut off the parts that are maybe okay, but they are limiting my fruit. That's what you're saying. And you say, God, use me, and then it hurts. Why, God, why? And God's like, I'm answering your prayer. You wanted me to use you to reach others, to serve others, to share my love with others. Then this is what is involved. Pruning. Because I want to bear more fruit in your life. That's why. If you don't want more fruit, then don't be pruned. We talk about this because in our family fellowship a few years ago, one of the major things we thought about was marriage, and we were teaching about marriage, and there's a couple of great books that have been published recently to really think about this. But in the States, people think marriage is about happiness. Marriage is about being happy, finding someone you love that completes you, all those sorts of things. That's actually not really what is in the Bible. Well, some helpful writers say this, marriage is not about your happiness. Marriage is about your holiness. Or to put it another way, what relationship would show you all the areas in which you still are not like Jesus Christ than marriage? What is more sanctifying that helps you see how much you really need God's grace and strength than marriage? If you think marriage is about happiness, then you marry someone for your own gain. I marry you because you make me happy. That sounds so great, but that's very selfish. Normal, but selfish. So I marry you because you make me happy. You marry me because, you know, you make me happy. Then that's why we're married. But then, of course, the second that one of us doesn't feel happy, well, then naturally we should go find someone else that makes us happy because marriage is about happiness. In the Bible, happiness is a big part of marriage. Don't get me wrong. I don't want you to think, oh, you and Karen... Ooh, but, but what the Bible says is marriage, for example, is about your holiness. It's about God showing you how much it means to really forgive, to really love someone, to really have compassion, to really be understanding, to really not put, to put aside our self-centeredness. That's what it means to focus on your holiness, not just your happiness. That is what it means to bear fruit. The idea that God would use these experiences so you can make a bigger impact, even when it hurts. When I was a young boy, my parents, both engineers and IT people and stuff, they got this side business. It was a print shop. It was a franchise print shop, and this is the early 80s. Now, that's a big deal now because you actually don't need most print shops anymore. You need copier shops because usually you can do everything at home on a computer now. But in the old days, you had to like go and like tell them, and they would print it on these big machines. To be honest, Tom, we, I think they owned it for several years, and I thought it caused a lot of marital problems. It caused a lot of strain. It was a big drain financially on my parents. And they would do their normal jobs until 5 or 6, and then go to this print shop and manage this business, this small business. They had employees. There was just so much work. And in the end, honestly, I think they lost thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars. And so I kind of grew up thinking, man, this, this was a bad mark on my parents' marriage life. It was difficult. That's how I viewed it. Years later, we're driving by the old site where the print shop was, and I was talking with my mother. I said, Mom, there's the print shop site. She's like, yeah. I said, well, that was kind of a bad idea, huh? She's like, no. Why would you say that? Uh, I, I thought the whole fighting and losing tens of thousands of dollars was bad. She's like, well, yeah, that was horrible, but you know, we think God used that. I said, why? She's like, well, if your dad hadn't learned to run a business and all the lessons he learned, he wouldn't have gotten his current job. Because I didn't know at the time what a, what a venture capitalist was. Venture capitalist is someone that takes capital and money and starts and runs companies. And so he basically, my mom said, we lost all that money and all that, all that difficultness because we think God used that to prepare your father for the business and the work he's called him to now. Oh, that is what it feels like. In the moments you're not happy, in the moment it's not fun, it's not easy, why, God, I thought you loved me. And God says, I do. And because I love you, my means, I'm going to prune you. I'm going to make it so that I'm going to take away the parts that are bad for you. 
unhealthy for you and unhealthy for others, but child, I'm also going to take away the parts that are perfectly fine. But if I take these parts away, if you understand that I'm doing this, it's so you can bear more fruit. You can have a bigger impact. You can make a bigger difference in the lives of people. You can do more fully what I want for you. How do we get to this? How do we participate in this? This sounds so good. Okay, fine. God, prune me. Oh, you know, come and prune me. I just, you know, like, just do what you need to do. And because I, I want my life to make a bigger impact. I want to be a greater blessing. I want to experience more of you working through me to love and serve people and bring justice and hope and redemption to this world. Do that. How do I participate? Well, now we come to our theme. Now we come to the topic of the Bible. Because in order to participate, Jesus is going to talk about this imagery. Abide in me. Now that sounds so spiritual. We in the States don't use the word abide. Oh, what were you doing? I was abiding at my house on Saturday. Oh, cool. You want to come over and we're going to abide? <laughs> like, we don't, we don't do that, right? But abiding in this context is remain. Some of the English translations use the word remain, but it's remain with a deep sense of loyalty and fidelity. And he's going to say, to abide in me has to do with obeying my teaching, my commands. That's where the connection is. And you're like, finally, Pastor Enoch, you get to the why this is in this theme of come thirsting, in God's word. So take a look at the gospel here. John chapter 15. Let's pick it up here in verse 3 for this kind of longer middle section. Verse 3 says this. Already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Here it is, verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, my teaching, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. What does it mean to abide in the love of Jesus? Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. How do we experience this change of God working in our lives? By abiding in the commands of God. If you do this, you will abide in my love. Now, we have the just really, really important understanding. So many times, myself and I think many Christians, we confuse the order. We think, okay, there's this thing called abiding in the love of Jesus, and there's this thing called obeying the commands of Jesus, right? We often think, I know I think it's this, okay, first I have to abide in the love of Jesus, and then from there, I will obey his commands. Like, the more I'm abiding in Jesus, his love, the more I'm going to obey his commands, right? Does that make sense? But that's actually not the order. That's not the logic. That's not how it works here. He says, you, abide, you obey my commands, and in, by obeying my commands, you actually abide in my love. What does that look like? Well, it means, let's say you want to go to the gym, and you want to lift weights. And there's this really big set of weights there on the, you know, on the, on the machine. Do you go like this? You go, you know, those are heavy weights. When I'm strong enough, I will lift them. I'm just going to wait until I get stronger, because when I'm strong enough, I'm going to lift them. Well, if you do that, you're going to wait a long time. No, no, no. You actually get stronger by trying to lift them. You have to go and do that. That's actually how you get stronger. I, I, a few years ago, I rented a DVD. That's how old it was. A DVD on how to sing, on, on, on how to sing proper and vocal technique. And I was thinking about like, increasing my upper note register range. You know, Just I don't know why. I think I discovered DVDs in my library. Just, oh, just borrow DVDs for free. So I got this, and there are these, these actually, I couldn't even do the exercise warm-ups. They're so high, and so I thought, well, I'm not going to sing those notes until I can sing them. I'm not going to sing high notes until I can get there. But the whole point of the exercise instructional DVD was, no, you get to those high notes by singing. So here's the idea. If you think, I'm not going to obey Jesus until I do it from love. Because love is everything. 
I don't want to obey Jesus out of obligation. So, Lord, because I honor you and respect you, I'm going to wait till I love you, and then I will obey you, because you don't want false love. If I waited to serve my family until after I always felt loved, they're going to wait a long time. If I said, honey, I, I want to take you out to dinner because I love you, so it, right now I'm kind of selfish, I'm not really there, so I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, going to, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm going to wait till I love you 100%, baby, then we'll go out to that nice dinner. She's going to be like, uh-uh, we're going now, right? Because this is the idea. What does it mean to abide in his love? You obey his commands. As you obey his commands you get the strength to obey more of his commands. You get more of his love. You begin. What does this look like? For example, take the issue of forgiveness, which is a whole other sermon series. People will say, I don't want to forgive you until I feel it. But life will tell you, and the Bible teaches this, you don't forgive after you feel it. Often, you extend forgiveness before you feel it. Actually, if you don't extend forgiveness, you may never feel it. Truly, Jesus says, Forgive, and by forgiving, then you will feel it. That's throughout the Bible, all spiritual areas of life. What does it mean to actually have God prune us, to have God help us bear more fruit? It means right now, today, in the struggling, in the ways that we stumble that we can, you obey the word of the Lord. You stay in his teaching. You stay in his love. That's what it's called to do. Because the means God uses to change us is he's going to prune us. He's going to cut off unhealthy parts, but also maybe trim off healthy, normal parts. Why would he trim off healthy, normal parts? To bear more fruit, to be more fruitful, to make a bigger impact, to be a greater blessing to those around us, to serve better our world, our society. How do we get to that? Sounds amazing. What do I do? How do I participate? Obey his commands even if you don't feel like it now. I'm not saying be a hypocrite. I'm not saying fake it till you make it. I'm simply saying, Jesus is saying in the logic here, if you keep my commandments, then you are abiding in my love. Keep my commandments. Jesus never says, obey me when you feel like it. Obey me when you're ready. I understand. Jesus says, no, 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 no. If I wait for you ready, you're never going to obey me. You obey me, and you will find that as you do my crazy commands, my radical commands, like forgiving those who hurt you? Who does that? Bless those that curse you? What kind of crazy person does that? You will find that as you do that, you will feel and experience more of my love. By doing so, you will bear more fruit. What's the basis? How do we possibly do that? Well, we've already read it in many ways, and we're going to bring it back here. Pick it up here in verse 5. What is the basis? How can we say this will happen? Verse 5. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now this, some of you are like, I've been waiting for the guy to talk about this because this verse sounds like a blank check. Um, you don't know what checks are. It sounds like you can ask God for anything. Well, let's talk about this. The imagery of the vine and branches, he's saying, look, it's a normal thing. If it's not producing fruit, he's going to cut it off. I would not push a word picture too far. I'm, I'm not sure this would teach. So if you don't you know, give money to the church, God's going to cut you off. If you don't love people, it's going to cut you off. I think this is not about when and how God cuts you off. He's simply saying this. To make more fruit, God prunes us. Okay? So I don't want to go too far into that, pushing that word picture more than it was meant by Jesus, at least I think. And then if you abide in me, ask whatever you wish. What is he saying? The more you know God's heart, the more God wants to give you answers to all the prayers. Because he knows you want it. Because you're more in his heart. In our summer camp for youth from our church, we got about 100 youth up to this conference site in Maine. And when I was running it, my friend Libby, a female counselor there, a youth leader there, she was in charge of the rifle range. Okay, rifles, because we're Americans, you know. So rifle range. And 
they have these, you know, they're not the biggest rifles, they're not AR-15s or anything, and so, but they would all be, you know, real rifles. They're not BB pellet guns, they're actually cartridges, magazines. And so, um, magazine meaning like the, the bullet with the casing. And so, the key thing is you had to meet her, Libby, at the, at the, at the, at the safe where they keep, they house the weapons, the fire, sorry, not weapons, sporting firearms. The spot firearms, and then you have to walk it up the hills of the range. And so inevitably, there's always this issue of who wants to carry, who's going to carry the rifles. Because a lot of these are city kids, urban kids from Chinatown, low income. They've never been up there. They've never seen like a real rifle and touched it. And so she looks. She tells me what she does. I was there one time with a bunch of our students meeting in the afternoon to go up to the rifle range, and she's got like you know some rifles, and she's looking around. Right, who wants to hold this? And there's a guy who's like me. I got it. No problem. Right here. I got it. Just. I can carry that. In fact, I can carry five. Just give it to me. And then this girl, this young girl, she was really timid. And Libby, my friend, looked at her and said, do you want to carry this? She's like, no, I'd rather not. She looked at them and gave it to the girl. And I said, why did you give it to the girl? She said, because she respects the weapon. She knows what I want. She understands this. This guy's asking all the stuff, but I'm not going to give it to him because he doesn't have my heart. He doesn't have my concern for safety. She, if she asked me for it, I let her carry it all the time. That's when God says, if you abide in my love, if you ask for things, if your prayer requests are laced with the intentions of God, with a desire to serve people, then my, the more selfish I am, I'm going to ask these kinds of selfish prayer requests. But the more like Christ I am, my prayer requests will be less and less about me my family and even my church and my prayer requests will be about other people and the world and the people that don't know Jesus and that's what he's saying. If you abide in me, you can ask me anything. If I trust you, if my heart is in you, you're going to ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. Why? Because when you ask me, you're going to be asking the things that I would ask myself. And this is what it means to have God's word in us. When the prayers that you pray are less about God help me pass my exam, help me, show me where to go. There's nothing wrong with those prayers. But maybe God might prune our prayer life and spend more time praying to know him rather than just get stuff from him, to experience him, to be a blessing to the community around us rather than help me, help me, help me. Nothing wrong with asking God for help. In fact, he invites that. But the more you know God, the more closer you follow Jesus, I just think you're going to ask less for yourself because you're going to have his heart. This is what it means to have God's word in us, that we begin to obey him and bear more fruit. That's what it means. It means even if I don't feel like it right now, not that I'm advocating being a hypocrite, but the idea of, you know, I can't always wait till my motives are 100% pure, if that's even possible. I'm going to abide in your love, Jesus, and abide in your words. I'm going to move in this direction and pray that as I do this, you are pruning me. You are encouraging me to be more like Jesus. That is what this is about. Your life may have unhealthy things. This is a large group of people now. I'm sure there are many of us here with unhealthy relationships, unhealthy thought patterns, emotions, beliefs. God may want to have a work with that. And you go, why? Because God's word is getting in you. If God's word is going to get in you, it's going to work its way through you, and then it's going to work its way out of you, and that's what's happening. He wants to prune that. And it's hard to do. We're not going to talk about it, obviously, here at this setting. It's a large group of people. Some of your groups are kind of large, 9, 10, 11 people. You might not be comfortable sharing in this setting. I understand. But hopefully, continue the conversation. Some of you, God wants to prune. You're doing too many things at church. You're just doing too many good things at church. And God wants to use you, and like a laser, he wants to focus you. But you're just doing too many good things. It's okay to focus on your children, as long as they're not your God. It's okay to focus on a few things. It's okay to say no to things. It's okay to, to do less, to do more. Some of us, God is ready and waiting. And you want, God, I want to so make an impact. That's why I'm doing 94 ministries. And God's like, Okay, I want to have you impact too, but rather than 94 shallow inches, I want to give you 94 feet and just move forward, 94 miles and just propel you. Not saying it's, I don't know the magic number of things you should do. It's not on me. It's between you and the Lord. 
what I am encouraging of, what this passage is saying is, if you say, God, change me, get your word into me, then he is going to do something. You're inviting him to prune you. And I'm excited and kind of anticipated and a little anxious. You know why? Because pruning is rarely pleasant. But if you want to bear much fruit, you need this. And you'll be glad God is pruning you. How is he pruning you? Some of us are not even there. Some of us aren't Christians. Some of us don't believe or we feel far from God. You just need to know that Jesus says, I'm going to abide with you. And I desire you to, I would desire you to be with me, Jesus. Jesus desires you. Do people at school desire you? <laughs> Do your parents sometimes you get the feeling they don't really desire you? But Jesus desires you. He doesn't want your fruit. He wants you. And because he loves you and the kind of God he is, when you're close to God, you will just make an impact for his kingdom. Because apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. This is what he's calling us to do. We have some questions for you as you begin to move to those groups. I'm going to give you the uh, questions now and then we'll dismiss you to groups. A few questions. How does the image, of, and you can't talk about all this in the next 15 minutes probably, but maybe think of one of these questions right now that is really going to jump out at you. And maybe that's the one you want to talk about. And when you come to your groups, you can pick the question. But first of all, how does the image of pruning relate to how God matures his followers? Maybe I explained it too quickly or I talked too fast. Maybe it would be helped to review. Or maybe you got it. If so, the second question, what is the relationship between obeying Jesus' commands and abiding in Jesus? Again, kind of deep, but I think if you got it, you don't have to talk about that. If it helps, go for it. Three and four, a little bit more pushing to next steps. How does it help to understand that God prunes us not so much to make us comfortable or happy, but to make us more holy and fruitful? Like, what if we really took that home and really understood that? And then lastly, if you are willing, what is an area of your life God may want to prune in order for you to bear more fruit for his good purposes? You can think about that now. I'm going to give you about five seconds to pick a question in your side silently. And then some of you, because you, you, you're kind of internal processors, some of you don't think before you talk. You think by talking, and that's fine. Uh, but some of you, just, just a few moments, pick a question and begin to think, how would you answer this? Because it may help this next discussion. Go ahead and pause and reflect on this. And, you know, hopefully you can continue it now. I invite you to go back to your groups and facilitators, manage your time. A lot of people, a lot of questions. You don't try to tackle them all but have a good discussion. We'll call you back in about 15 minutes.
So I'm going to pray for us in about 30 seconds. You can stay if you want to after during the break, but we're going to break in about 30 seconds. Okay, I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, let me close in prayer. If you want to continue as a group, I guess that's okay. If some of your group members need to stand up, that's fine. But let me pray for us and bring this time to a close so we can uh, take a quick break. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that as we reflect on this, that, that was a lot. That was a, that was a lot of teaching that Jesus just gave us through his short little story. Um, and we pray that it would actually have its way in and through us. We might wonder what kind of God you are. Why would you do that? And we're reminded that, oh, it's because you actually desire to bear fruit through us. You want to see positive change in us and use us to bring positive change to the world around us. I guess that's what we really want. But sometimes we don't think about that when the pruning process may not feel pleasant or easy. And yet, Lord, I think if we pause and are humble and honest, we do want to have a bigger impact for your kingdom. Not for our glory, not for our sense of significance, but so that we can make a bigger impact for your name's sake, O oh Lord. So do that. Help us. Prune us. Prune CGCD. Prune all the believers here. Prune even those that are, maybe those that aren't yet bearing fruit. They're not believers. Would you work in their lives so that they can become the branches that would bear the kind of fruit that you want in their lives. Help us to go from here to a break and enjoy the fellowship. And we just thank you and trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm looking at Sam, or no one's running up to me, so Tommy. Okay, break for 20 minutes, 20 minutes or so.